Hello everyone, my name is Tom Sadler, I'm a software engineering team lead for BBC iPlayer and Sounds and today I'm going to talk to you about how we've been using internal IRCs to enhance our collaboration. So I work on iPlayer and Sounds for connected TV devices, so that's smart TVs, set-top boxes, games consoles and streaming sticks. We're about 100 engineers spread across 10 teams. So before we look at how we've been using RFCs internally, we should look at RFCs in the open source world. It's worth remembering that inner source is the use of open source best practices for software development within the confines of an organization, and RFCs are no exception to this. Probably the most famous usage of RFCs is by the IETF for Internet Standards. Uh, although RFCs don't always become standards, they can be informational or experimental. RFCs were invented in 1969 by Steve Crocker as part of ARPANET, a pre precursor to the Internet. And the intent was to produce temporary and formal memos on network protocols without making official decisions or asserting authority and importantly, encouraging others to contribute. RFCs are used widely in open source projects. One example is Rust, which uses lightweight RFCs to achieve consensus on designs of substantial changes. Substantial might be a bit ambiguous, and the meaning of substantial changes over time, but Rust provides some examples, such as changes noticeable by users of Rust, as opposed to developers of Rust, and changes to interfaces. I call that Rust uh, because it's um, what we based our RFC process on, but also in my research I found that there were many other open source projects that use RFCs inspired by Rust. So why did we adopt RFCs? It's worth looking at the problem space and the context that we found ourselves in before we chose to adopt them. So all changes that affected multiple teams went through the technical leadership group, the TLG. This was about 15 people made up of team leads, principal engineers and architects. As you might imagine, this isn't really scalable, having all decisions go through this one group of people. And it also meant that we were only getting direct input from TLG members, although they were expected to, support, um, to represent their team as well. Everything was decided in meetings, again not very scalable, making all decisions in a one hour time slot every week. There was no guarantee that decisions would be documented. There were limited opportunities for cross-team collaboration outside the TLG, and knowledge was shared after the decision was already made, which is arguably too late. So we hoped that RFCs would help us achieve empowerment of individuals and teams to propose and contribute to wide-reaching changes rather than having it all on the TLG, enable asynchronous remote input rather than requiring meetings, transparent decision making and documentation of those decisions, and an increase in cross-team collaboration and knowledge sharing. So how did we go about doing this um, and how did RFCs add value? We also found problems with RFCs and had to iterate on our process. So using RFCs was uh, initially proposed by one of our team leads and one of our principal engineers followed up on this later. Um, this principal had seen RFCs used effectively in Rust, so he used the Rust template as a starting point and wrote our very first RFC, which was to use RFCs. In terms of tooling, we used paper, uh, Dropbox paper, um, because everyone at the BBC has access to paper, whereas only engineers have access to GitHub, and we didn't want any disciplines to be blocked from contributing. So our initial use case for RFCs was proposing TLG working groups, uh, and we thought this was a good use case because we didn't want to spend meeting time discussing proposals. RFCs allowed us to propose and feedback on these proposals asynchronously, and this meant that by the time we next met, we had enough information to make decisions on working groups. And there were six proposals, and four of them went forward. So the TLG accepted our first RFC, which was to use RFCs, um, and then us leaders started encouraging uh, 
usage of RFCs and trying to cultivate an RFC culture. And like with many things, culture is very important and often the hardest thing to get right. And with RFCs in particular, psychological safety is really important. People need to feel comfortable putting their, de- their ideas out there and they also need to feel comfortable um, commenting on other people's ideas in a non-confrontational way. We also found when we tried to um, use RFCs wider than the TLG that the process wasn't entirely clear, so we had a second meta RFC that would um, clarify the process. Then we also started a Slack channel so that there was a centralised place to share RFCs and they would be visible. So we started to get some momentum with RFCs uh, and there were some big technical changes that were decided via RFCs. One was that we started using ECMAScript modules instead of asynchronous module definition, which was a very big change and something that was proposed by a single team via RFCs we were able to get buy-in across the whole department. Another was around improvements to our CD pipeline. It was to do with um, reducing duplication of tests being run and this reduced our time to deploy by about 26 minutes. It's not just technical changes we've used RFCs for, we were also able to agree some uh, wide-reaching process changes around test terminology and best practices and changes to our out-of-hours support model. But again the more we used RFCs the more we discovered more about them, discovered ways we could do them better. So we found that we weren't really measuring the value or having RFCs be accountable. So we added a retrospective section to the RFC template to try and address that. We also found that there was ambiguity around their interaction with ADRs, architectural decision records. We decided that you can use both either or neither, depending on the situation. But RFCs are around collaborative problem solving decision making, whereas ADRs are for recording decisions and implementation detail. We also found that RFCs were sometimes getting accepted without relevant people being consulted. So for this reason, we implemented the idea of nominated owners so that there were defined people that had to sign off on an RFC before it could become accepted. So having iterated on our process, we saw more high impact work coming out of RFCs, things like defining APIs for shared libraries. Um, and a big one was an agreement to move to a, a monorepo structure for all of our closed source TV client code. Um, and also complementing RFCs to define the monorepo structure uh, and module standards for use in the monorepo. So we thought we were doing quite well with RFCs, but to learn more, we ran a retrospective at about the one year mark of using them. Um, Some of the good things we found was that they were collaborative as we wanted. We found that they were empowering mid and junior engineers, not just seniors and above. They streamlined decision making because there was less need for synchronous meeting based communication. They did provide visibility. And also having structured proposals made those proposals more coherent. However, some of the things that we are struggling with and don't necessarily have solutions for yet are retros on RFCs not often happening, um, despite the fact that they are part of the template. We're rarely getting input from non-engineers, despite the fact that we chose paper for this exact reason. We've also found that you can use RFCs too much. Sometimes verbal communication is more appropriate. Sometimes RFCs aren't getting communicated broadly enough, despite the Slack channel. Uh, And sometimes RFCs become a wall of text, which isn't um, the most accessible way for some people to consume that knowledge. Uh, Either they learn better from diagrams or they learn better from hearing someone talk, uh, or it might just be that they don't have background knowledge necessary to understand an RFC. So we also brought out some metrics from our RFCs. Um, We'd written, so we'd had 46 accepted that were written by 16 unique authors 
uh, and they were read by 188 unique readers. Now you'll note that this is a lot more than our department size, which is about 100. So this shows that we are getting other disciplines reading them, just not necessarily commenting on them. Um, but we're also sharing our RFCs with other members of iPlayer and Sounds on other platforms uh, and other divisions too. The most read RFC or the most unique readers for an RFC was the initial monorepo one, which got 55 unique readers. I think this graph is quite interesting. It shows the distribution of RFC readers. Um, so you can see that the modal average is 27 to 35 readers, uh, of which, for which there were 11 RFCs that had this many readers. Uh, and you can see the outlier on the far right, um, our monorepo RFC that got read 55 by 55 unique readers. And then the less popular ones, we're looking at a minimum of nine readers for, the, for those ones. So given that we've seen RFCs in the open source uh, and we've seen RFCs work internally for us, uh, RFCs could be considered a pattern. So for anyone who's not familiar with the InnerSource uh, Patterns community, InnerSource Patterns is about recognizing that different companies often have similar problems and solve them in similar ways. Transparent collaborative decision-making is one such problem and internal RFCs are a potential solution. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to Sebastian Spear and the wider patterns community for getting the initial RFC pattern written up and merged before this talk. And I'm hoping that this talk can help contribute back into that pattern as well, with the BBC being a, or BBC iPlayer and Sounds being a proved usage of this pattern. Um, but thanks to the research that Sebastian did, um, I was, I was able to uh, dig into an Uber blog, and this Uber blog referenced a Google blog. Um, Google call this pattern design docs rather than RSCs. But these were another two instances of this type of pattern being used for internal collaboration. There were similar problems being solved and similar benefits being reaped. And there was a lot I could learn from Uber and Google. As we saw from the retrospective, there is still a lot, of, a lot of improvements that we can make. And by using the pattern methodology, learning from other companies, I'm hoping that I can take these learnings away and improve our process. So please do get involved in the uh, Inner Source Patterns group. Um, it's available on Slack as well as GitHub. Uh, and especially if you've got experience with RFCs, so we can find more instances of this pattern and learn more from each other. And thank you everyone for listening.